RugbyRenegade.com, the number one online strength and conditioning program for rugby. Are you ready to get bigger, stronger, fitter, and faster and dominate your opposition? Welcome to the Rugby Renegade Podcast, where we build machines. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Rugby Renegade podcast. Today's podcast is sponsored by Pro Athlete Supplementation. Check them out at ps-nutrition.co.uk. I'm Jamie Bain, but today I'm taking a bit of a backward step and handing over the reins to Dan Jones. He's he's finally back on the podcast and he's interviewing Cardiff Blues and USA Eagles legend Blaine Scully. So give it a listen and let us know what you think. Guys, welcome to the Rugby Renegade podcast uh, with myself, Dan Jones. Uh, different voice this time. Usually we have Jamie Bain running the show, uh, but as we're based uh, here in Cardiff with Blaine Scully, USA Eagles co-captain, um, a colleague of mine at Cardiff Blues, so I thought I'd just as well uh, pick up the baton and do the interview myself. So, Blaine, welcome to the Rugby Renegade podcast. Good to have you on. Thanks for having me. Good stuff. So what I'd like to do really is um, just perhaps start off by touching on um, a little bit of history, of, you know, the background of your career really. So, you know, a little bit of background of your, your personal background and maybe a little bit of your rugby career, where, where you got going. So yeah, where did it all start, mate? So I guess it's probably started, I grew up like any other American kid, playing just about every sport I could. Um, I come from a football family, family of athletes. So my, my dad played college football. My brother played college football. A couple of uncles played college baseball. Um, so pretty fortunate to be surrounded by athletes and and uh, didn't really fall into rugby until I was 18. I played water polo and basketball and I swam in high school. I was All-American in swimming and water polo and potentially some opportunities to do that in college. But um, just for one reason or the other, um, Rugby found me. Mom did a pretty good job keeping me away from football when I was younger, although I would have loved to have played. And and uh, I think it was all kind of meant to be. And, and as she says, change one thing, change them all. And luckily enough, I found rugby and just been riding the wave ever since. So how did you find rugby then? So from, you know, obviously uh, football being a, a massive sport, and if you're an all-American swimmer, uh, how, how did rugby come and, and land on your lap? Yeah, so I, I ended up picking it up at university my first year. So I was 18, introduced by a buddy who I went to high school with who played rugby in high school. And funny enough, the high school I went to is a national championship winning rugby program. And uh, they're usually really competitive and um, always producing really good talent. And a lot of national team players have come out of Jesuit High School, which is where I went. And um, picked it up at 18. Um by 19, I was an All-American and, and attended some sevens camps, and um, I ended up transferring from UCLA, where I was at when I first started out in university, to somewhere closer to home, and and uh, University of California, Berkeley, and they have a varsity program there, one of the, probably the first and foremost, finest public institution in the United States, and then um, from a rugby perspective, two of probably the, the greatest American rugby coaches and, and, and national team players that we have. So um, Jack Clark and, and, and Coach Tom Phillips. So really fortunate to be mentored by them and and, and uh, have an incredible experience. Brilliant. So in your time, um, obviously high school and college, um, did, you, did you pick up any trophies in that time? Did you have a successful side? In, in what? In high school or oh, in for, college as well? Yeah, um, so when... In college, when we went to Cal, we, we won two national championships, which was pretty cool. Um, really, really amazing to be a part of. And I think one of the things that they do a good job of, and um, more than anything else, is it's about not just about the sport, it's about growing men. Yeah. And I think I ended up walking away, as they like to say sometimes, with a PhD and a team. Mm. What it means to be a teammate, um, how important it is to be a part of that team, um, developing leadership skills and actual awareness to become, try to become a leader and, and, and become a, a part of a culture that's bigger than myself. Mm. Um, so pretty foundational to, to not only my career, but who I am as an individual. 
Yeah, brilliant. I know um, we touched upon this type of thing previously in um, one of our previous podcasts. Jamie and myself were talking about what it takes to work in sport on the other side of the fence, so an S and C or a physio. Um, and you know, you, you hear a lot of it coming out uh, from, from maybe perhaps the Kiwi culture. They they have a sort of a you know a well known phrase. Um, and I think you know John Miles, who's uh, head of medical here at the Blues. He he. He has a, a very similar phrase. He says, "Just don't be a dick," and uh, I think that's something that you know is is key. You know, the biggest part of fitting into any mm. team or organisation is that you know it's team first. It's not about the individual, and that's and that's good to hear. This you know, it's it's worldwide. It's not just South Wales, New Zealand, the US. I think it applies wherever you are. Yeah, I think the principles and and what makes a team is it's pretty universal. Yeah. Um, exactly what you said I think fundamentally teams are about people mm. and treating people with respect and then also have growing awareness and growing a culture that's based on more than who you are as an individual obviously yeah. you have your own role to play but I think one of the, the cool things about my experience at Cal is learned from a leadership point of view um, you're a leader by a simple fact that you make people around you better and more productive yeah. that's the only definition of being a leader mm. which makes it really attainable you yeah. don't have to have this superhuman charisma you don't have to be the best player on the team all you have to do is trying to be yourself better and more productive and then make somebody a teammate better and more productive and that makes you an effective teammate and an effective leader yeah and I no doubt success follows and if you get that right no doubt success follows so in terms of um, so sort of the playing career so you, you're obviously going well back home how did that transition from USA rugby or you know doing well in college high school how did that transfer to fi- finding yourself in the UK playing uh, playing your sort of professional rugby here yeah so um graduated university in 2011 was fortunate enough to be um uh, picked for the national team yeah and uh went to the 2011 world cup um and uh, had previously had some sevens experience. I would go to the circuit stops at the end of the school year, as it was. And um, incredible experience down in New Zealand. And, and I think uh, I knew before that moment, but kind of sunk in there is this is what I want to do. This is who I am. I want to I want to do rugby. And um, there wasn't really any other thing for me. Um, and so that be kind of came my focus and, and, and my direction and my drive and really sought to apply myself wholeheartedly into playing overseas mm-hmm. and, and trying to make a living, making tackles for a living. Mm-hmm. And um, 2013, after I ruptured my Achilles in, in 2012, and a, just before we were about to take off to Hong Kong Sevens, and... Uh, which I kind of call my character year, my character injury, which I think ended up hardening my resolve to to um, keep fighting and, and try to get to where I wanted to go. Um, and again, really fortunate to be supported by some amazing people I mentioned before, but Coach Tom Billups, who's, who's kind of been my mentor through mm-hmm. this process, he kind of said, come home and we'll heal you up. And, and we did that. And nine months later, it was back in action and, Summer of 2013, I ended up on a two-week trial in Leicester with no ex- no expectation really other than that I was going to give it my best shot and enjoy myself. Mm-hmm. And two weeks kind of turned into four weeks, which turned into four months, which turned into a year and turned into another season. And here I am almost five years later. And uh, it's been a pretty incredible ride. And, and, I mean, I think my journey isn't... Um, Special. I think I've been very fortunate from young age to be supported by my family and and then these amazing people I've kind of connected with along the path, mm. uh, from people in USA Rugby to you know, Coach Tom Billups and Jack Clark, who immense influence on my career, to Jordan Murphy's when I was at Leicester and um, really good relationships there and and have just kind of grown from each opportunity and and each interact, individual had an impact on, on my development and mm. and kind of where I am today. It's good to hear um, 
you know, good for our listeners to hear as well, the sort of... Uh, the non-glamorous side of, of professional sport, obviously, you know, a big thing that we put out is sort of injury prevention and, and, and rehab. And I think quite often people see the final product, which is that sort of, um, you know, extravagant dive for a score or, you know, picking trophies up. But there's always dark moments in a rugby mm. player's career. And it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, from the low point of tearing the Achilles, you know, 12 months later, whatever it was, you're sort of uh, on trial at Leicester Tigers. So there's obviously a lot of hard work on in behind the scenes there. And I think it's uh, it's good for our listeners to hear that because, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have those tough times. And it's about, I suppose, digging in and, and not giving yeah. up, really. Yeah, I think it's just all about decisions. Mm. You know, I think we consciously make decisions, consciously and unconsciously make decisions. Mm. And um, I think you can either make the decision that's going to be the worst thing in your life or you can make a decision that, I can actually grow from this adversity. And um, there's probably a lesson I learned from my mom pretty early on. So when I was six, almost seven years, seven years old, my mom was running for district attorney of Sacramento. And uh, during her election, she, she went on to become the first woman ever to become elected in major county. Um, my dad passed away. And um, for something like that to happen to... To her, obviously, this is something she's been working for her whole life. Hardy had spent a dozen years in the office, um, almost 16, and and kind of the what should be the um, realization of all that hard work and kind of the elation she would get from from winning that election ended up being the hardest part because she lost the only person she loved most in the world, mm. you know, and she had two kids and, and, um, so from that point, her resolve to, um, not let that tragedy define her life, but, um, move on and, and, and throw herself into becoming the best she could in, in her, in her job as district attorney, which she then served for 20 years and nobody could even run against her because, that's how solidly she held down that mm. position to being a great mom and never missing really many sport activities or anything um, from my sister and I. And I mean, I think those are kind of the examples, at least to me, that highlight the fact that, you know, we are what we decide to be. Mm. And, and um, you know, because I, I kind of say, I say it in private, but it's, I don't think anyone would have blamed her if she would have decided that this would have been too tough of a thing mm. but she made decisions like no this is this is my life and it's my family and I've worked hard for this and and she's been incredible she just recently retired and she's she started out in sexual assault and child abuse and she ended up um raising close to a million dollars for for a non-profit which now targets supporting sexual assault and child abuse victims and and uh, kind of a one-stop shop. So it's just this incredible person, this incredible woman who's mm. kind of been my true role model and hero. So who's really highlighted the fact that we are what we decide to be, you know. Yeah. An amazing role model to have. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. So in terms of your, um, your sort of, your rugby S&C background, um, obviously what, what, we, what we deliver is, is support for S&C. And um, it's interesting that, you know, you know that the UK has a huge amount of um, support for young athletes now. You know, the modern professional game, boys are really having contact with, you know, professional strength and conditioning coaches, physiotherapists, you know, for injury prevention, etc. Um, at a young age, maybe 16 with some academies now in, in, in the UK and Ireland. And, and so I'm just interested in, you know where that sort of um, early S and C started for you. Who was the biggest influence yeah. uh, on your sort of uh, strength and conditioning career in the early days and and through to professional rugby? Yeah, so I mean, I think it is. We live in, in the United States in a culture of athletic development. Everything mm. we kind of do is is all about developing as an athlete. And pretty from a young age, we start pretty early doing ladders and sprint testing and jumping and even weightlifting and training and and because most of our 
sports is, is through the school system. You yeah. know, that becomes part of the infrastructure we go through. Yeah. So high schools have really good gyms because we need to develop high school football players and basketball players and mm. swimmers. And yeah. I mean, that's just what we do. Um, and millions and millions of dollars get invested in that and, and professional coaches. And and um, so really fortunate to have, have had access to all that. And, and I think one of the things that I've kind of always been is, is super curious um i kind of always want to know i always want to know why i'm doing things what is it going to do and then how does it translate to mm. whatever my athletic endeavor is um so uh, you know kind of on that the balance between having the access to the resources and being curious and then you know probably the biggest influence would be tom Billups, another guy who i mentioned before yeah and um he was at snc stroke coach at cal and um so uh, I mean, that's where I kind of refine my technique. So, and it's just not about moving the heaviest way that you can. It's a pretty holistic approach to movement. Yeah. And and so he's recently they Cal Rugby's moved to um, Sparta Sports Science, which uses force plate analysis, and you get a movement signature, and and then based on what type of athlete you are and what your needs are, that's kind of the workout program you would get. And it's not even a workout program. It's called movement prescriptions, which yeah. is pretty interesting because. You know, I think the thing was, is if you move more efficiently, um, you become a more effective athlete. Yeah. And if you can proficiently do those complex movements from a power clean to a deadlift and mm. you do it in a, in a healthy way, you're going to be a, a healthier athlete, and which means you're going to be on the field more, which mm. means you're going to be able to get better and contribute to the team. Right. And really, for me, that's kind of the whole point of strength conditioning i i don't i I actually see kind of it as part of this whole package not necessarily isolated in this way it's yeah it's 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 about me as an individual and how it how it mirrors itself on the field and how is it replicated and how is it transferred because i mean i i think the reason why i stretch and do mobility is so i can get into more functional positions when i move and move weight yeah and the reason why i move weight is so i can get bigger bigger faster stronger when i take the field so then i'm a better rugby player i mean so i I think most people i think they sometimes can look at things in isolation but really the being able to see that seeing that 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 kind of your own little journey through that i I think for me makes it really valuable because then i can actually have purpose why why movement and, and why each component is super important i think what i find uh really interesting from your background as well is the fact that you've had multi-sport um, exposure coming coming through the ranks, if you like. So swimming, you know, being being the obvious achievement there. And I think a lot of the research or evidence out there shows that early specialisation in sport cause can potentially cause, um, you know, maladaptation and, mm. and, and injury. And I think it's it's great to hear someone almost coming into into rugby quite late in the in their years, you know, and. Uh, I know in South Wales we pick up a rugby ball at eight years old and, and 90% of our sport is rugby and I just wonder how that sort of sets us up in the future. So it's great to hear that mm. um, variety of sports and I think it helps I think it helps individuals as, as better athletes, 100%. probably more robust and potentially better sports people as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's good to hear that and I think yeah. it's, it's something that, you know, the ideal would be to see more kids doing more sports not narrowing down to rugby too too early because i'm sure it causes a lot of problems yeah i i I totally agree with that i think you know even still because it is a very big thing because in in the states they specialize early so you can get a scholarship to go to university and 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 if you get a scholarship to go to university you got a better chance to go professional and yeah and so i mean i i I fundamentally think have playing having played those sports and playing so much basketball and, and water polo and swimming and baseball and and flag football and, and all that stuff. When I finally did specialize, I was in a better position and actually my growth and returns became that much greater because mm. um, it was a holistic package as an athlete. And you know, my missus was the same way. She was a three-sport athlete and, and she was a better at, total athlete um, for it. So, mm. yeah, I would 100% agree. It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting area. So, in terms of um, in terms of the S and C, you know, obviously you've you've got a you know a 
very rounded background but which part of strength and conditioning would you say is is your favorite part you know which part do you really enjoy the most um and which part do you really excel in you know because i'm sure a lot of our younger rugby players out there would think you know i'm i'm playing in the back three uh, what area should i work on what area is is an area that will really improve me as a back three player so i'd be interested to see what area you enjoy and what area you focus on to make sure that you're, you know, you're on point come yeah. game day? Yeah, no, I, one thing I do love is I, I do love speed work. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of have the same workout, same warm-up every single day. Um, and it's usually speed running mechanic-based. Um, and so when I get the opportunity to do some resisted sprints, so sled drags specifically, um, which I highly rate is actually my actually my favorite thing in the world is hill sprints, mm. um, just because I feel like that takes all the boxes for for what I need as a back back three player and specific to my athletic needs, which is ability to put force in the ground, move quickly, and have to do it a bunch of times a game. Mm. Um, so I found that the hill sprint has actually been a really good development tool for me, um, but most of us don't have access to a hill day in and day out and. And so the sled becomes a really important component to that. Um, then moving to the gym, power clean is my favorite exercise, hands down. Um, but also box card with plyometrics, which I equally love to do. Mm. So um, I think those would would be my favorite exercises. Um, what one of the areas I have to work hard at is is um, kind of that repeat speed because I love staying in that power zone where I can take three minutes in between my power clean yeah. and, and just because I love the, how that kind of flows into the workout. But, um, you know, the, the repeat sprints is, is is a huge component of that. And I, I don't, it's not that I don't enjoy it. It's just, I think every athlete knows areas that they have to focus on and they have to kind of be conscious of, of getting the most out of themselves in that area because um, you need more discipline probably to get it done. I think um, it's an area that's overlooked by many as well. It's like I said before, back three players cutting the line and scoring a great try. But you know, I think the back three perform uh, a huge amount of work that people don't notice. Yeah. You know, to to make that kick 100%. a good kick. You know, the box kick or or kick for territory. You know, we we we're fortunate to have GPS and we look at the meters per minute and we also look at total distance covered and quite often. You know your wide backs, your full, your full back and wingers, particularly the wingers, cover so much work, and it's high speed running and it's, re- it's repeated work. And you know, like we have a we have a ranking, don't we, here mm-hmm. at the Blues, where you know after after games or training sessions, you can see the work that people have done. And I think that's maybe one thing that you know, obviously, our listeners and our and, and our subscribers can take away is that the work off the ball that you guys do as a back three is huge, and and therefore. The work that you have to put in in the week mm. to to be able to tolerate those loads mm. is huge. Yeah, absolutely, you know. So training, training particularly hard, so that you're robust enough to cope with those loads on a weekend. And I think that's something that people miss potentially. They don't see that amount of uh, work going in because mm. that's essentially what makes you robust to prevent hamstring injuries mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or you know fatigue related injuries. So. Yeah, it's a really interesting area, you know, that maybe one that's neglected is that repeated ability to to sprint and cover cover long distances. Yeah, I think it's pretty natural that people think, you know, the job of a winger is to sprint when he gets the ball on his head and on the edge and finish in the corner, which mm. is part of it. But exactly what you said, the unseen part is you're probably going to have to ch- chase the ne- next kickoff. <laughs> yeah. And it's a sprint moment. Yeah. You're going to have to chase chase the next box kick that's the sprint moment yeah. you have to cover the backfield when the fullback has to close because there's an overlap that's another sprint moment so yeah. there's all these sprint moments box card yeah. in 80 minutes so you can't just do one well you have to yeah. be able to cope with an 80 minute game yeah of course that's a good uh, it's a good one to lead into the next question really in terms of um, you know we quite often ask which opposition player or, or even teammate, um, you know, in the past uh, or present, um, do you respect the most for their sort of fitness or, or physical ability? Um, so I'm sure you've had a number of top class opponents and yeah. teammates. So, so it's just interesting who, who, you know, 
out, out of out of uh, you know your career so far, you'd pick out not not just one individual. Obviously, if there's if there's more than one name that springs to yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean it's been pretty fortunate enough to play in a couple of World Cups now, so been been able to play against some of the world's best. And um, I mean, I think one of my one of the players I have most respect for as a teammate, his name's Chris Wiles, and he plays for Saracens on the left wing. And and you know, I think someone always said people have this kind of image of what potentially a, a back three player, or a winger is, or even what a rugby player is. And the thing that strikes me about Chris is he's he's one of the best rugby players you'll see. Um, you might not notice the stuff that he does, but he's the most one of the most balanced athletes. He's strong, he's fast, his repeat fitness is is world class and, and and his skills on the ball are are equally as impressive. So, I mean he's he's one I have a huge amount of respect for and and, and it's not having all that is are just tools in the toolbox, but he's, are you able to access those tools in pressure situations? And mm. he repeatedly does that for the series and he did that for the United States when he played for us. And you look at somebody on the opposite wing, you know, Chris Ashton. Yeah. And and talked about work off the ball. I think just watching him this past weekend, the reason why he scores so many tries is because he's sprinting from five meter line to five meter line, looking for another opportunity. Mm. So, I mean, those are two examples right there. And been able to play against Brian Habana, and obviously, a pretty impressive character. Um, and uh, played against him as when he played for Toulon, when he plays for Toulon, and and also for the Springboks. So, uh, I mean, it's it is one of the the cool parts of our game is um, being able to compete against the best. Yeah. Um, but also, one of the foundational elements of our game is having respect for opposition and for teammates. So, yeah. I think it's a really cool question because it kind of highlights all the stuff that rugby. Uh, what was unique about rugby? Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I think we're fortunate. Really, there's, there's a huge amount of respect amongst. Um, Players and you know it's off field staff as well. You know, it's, mm. once the game's over, there's you know, there's always that opportunity to discuss ideas, discuss you know what what people are doing well, what, what they're not doing well. It's uh, you know it's great. It's you know it's it's what we love about the game, isn't it? It's um you know it's interesting to hear you talking about uh, USA teammates and it's obviously uh, a huge accolade that you're you know co-captain of the USA uh, Eagles side and. Um, just talk to us a little bit about you know being part of that setup and how, you know, how proud you must be of you know leading that group of men and you know obviously representing your country. Um, you know you represent your country every week at the Blues because every time we play a home game we hear the chants USA USA in the background. Um, so it's just be interesting to sort of get a bit of an insight to USA rugby and and you know how you know how proud you are of you know representing your, your country really yeah I mean I think it's it's the highlight for me um it's who I am it's I kind of I'm an American rugby player um which might seem like a uh like a funny thing over here sometimes but uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that and um we're at a pretty interesting moment right now in the states. It's from a youth level, it's one of the fastest growing team sports, and and awareness is raising because of the Olympics and how well our sevens guys are doing week in and week out, and yeah. top five in the world right now, which is incredible. They're and doing an amazing job. Hopefully, they can crack on this weekend. And um, you know, so we have this kind of groundswell of momentum, kind of building to a movement, and to be a part of that and representing the Eagles. Um, and and the United States is everything to me, and and to the teammates, and the teammates that stand shoulder to shoulder with me. So uh, I think the the important thing to that I consciously uh, remember is that it's not necessarily about me, and 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 it's about the jersey and the flag on the jersey, and the opportunity to represent that for short amount of time is something to be really grateful for so the thing that that I try to do every time I'm able to put it on is is wear it with pride and and also try to leave it in a better place than I found it that's great and obviously um you know a lot of people are obviously aware of your on-field um 
sort of commitments and, and exploits uh, in terms of USA rugby, but I don't suppose too many people would be aware of your your activity off field. Um, what I'm referring to is, you know, you you're one of the founders or the founder of uh, the USRPA, so the the US Rugby Players Association, which, you know, for for someone like obviously I'm a physiotherapist and have a massive interest in player welfare. Um, you know, it's, it's what we spend our time time doing is is, you know, protecting player welfare and trying to drive those. Uh, you know that side of our sport, so you know it's it's something that I'm really interested in to see a current player driving sort of player welfare for the for the benefit of future sort of eagles and and and, and young um, American rugby players. So it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about yeah. that and and how that's come about and and, and how how that's developing. Yeah, well, I, we we try to do it for a number of years and. Um, you know, I think we've we've been pretty fortunate that we now have a kind of a group of really committed players. Um, both recently retired, James Gillenwater, who's was a former sevens captain, who's been pretty instrumental. Pedro Knight, who's a former fifteens and sevens player. Kelly Griffin, who's an Olympic sevens cap, women's captain, and and Rio um, and Zach Tess has been really committed to to this as well. And so some really really impressive people who who are doing this essentially because they care. Yeah. And um, so what we're trying to do is exactly kind of how we left the, the U.S. question, which is leave the jersey in a better place than we found it. And I think probably a, a really good way to do that is to create a structure and create a, a an association where the players can have the highest quality player experience because, you know, you know as well as anybody that this isn't forever. Mm -hmm. And so being able to support our players to our utmost while we can and, and USA Rugby, we have a partnership with them now, which is great, and we have a lot of work to do, but um, we're slowly starting to, to climb our way there, and and, um, and it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting that we have all four teams a part of this, which um, I think is, is crucial, having both men and women aligned and, yeah. and under the same umbrella because we're all rugby players. Yeah, of course. And with, with similar and different needs. Um, but we all equally need to be supported, and um, so that's really important to us. And um, I think being able to to help people through their career at the at the beginning of their career, the middle part of their career, and then with career transition, is 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 a huge thing. And now as as we're starting to grow as a, as a sport and evolve into players and athletes who only experience has ever been professional and being able to, to help with a framework for them to, to maximize their career, but also leave themselves in a position to be successful after in their second career. Mm. Because you know, honestly, there's there's not many people in rugby who aren't gonna have a second job when, when they retire. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important that people have the option to make their own decisions on what they wanna do. Yeah. Um, so that's why we're kind of really passionate about it and, and, and um, hoping we can do all that we can to make it what it hopefully can be for for the players yeah well it's a it's a brilliant uh it's a brilliant movement and i you know i i hope uh you know i hope it goes from strength to strength because the, the player welfare side of things is crucial and uh you know that's not that's not only injury there's there's a mm. there's a wider scope there it's uh you know it's it's it's, it's personal you know um career post rugby uh, there's, you know, there's emotional support. There's a there's a lot there that, uh, you know, that, that that probably needs. You know, there's a gap that needs filling, and it's it's brilliant to see it being done. Look, Brian, I think we've covered a fair bit there, mate. Um, it's been brilliant to have you on. Uh, brilliant to, uh, for our sort of listeners. You know, USA, uh, North America. You know, and and the, and the wider world. Really, we've got a. You know, we've got a quite a broad subscription so it's been brilliant to hear some of the things about you know usa rugby and and obviously your experiences in the uk so thank you for coming on board thanks for having me thanks really for it. giving us the time and um maybe we'll have you back on in the future to uh, wait for another catch-up can't wait man cheers mate thanks top man yeah great stuff thank you blaine uh, really great to hear about rugby over in the US and how that's coming on and uh, and great for Dan to sit down and speak to you. Uh, in the meantime guys keep checking us out at rugbyrenegade.com and check us out on social media, Instagram, Twitter Facebook and YouTube 
Um, and of course, give us a five star review on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, whatever podcast you use to listen to us. Uh, give us a good review and we'll keep them coming. Until next time. Thanks for listening to the Rugby Renegade Podcast. For more quality rugby strength and conditioning information, check us out at rugbyrenegade.com. Rugby Renegade, building machines.